Thanks, Rupesh, and thanks, Sadie, for organizing a really great microbi microbiome and virome session. Um, our next speaker really doesn't need an introduction, but I'll, I'm going to give him a short one. Uh, this session is called New Technology for MECFS Research. And um, Dr. Ron Davis is the director of the Standard Stanford Genome Center and has been involved in MECFS research and been a leader um, in that, and actually a leader in many areas of technology. He doesn't know it, I've never told him, but actually some of the early work with Peter Ufner and others actually impacted my career 20 some years ago. Um, so I, I feel a debt actually to some of the work that you've, you've done there from the past. So it really is a great pleasure to introduce you today and to hear about the molecular basis of MECFS. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, the title of my talk is a little optimistic, uh, but that's what we need to always do, try to keep pushing forward. Um, uh, so um, the first thing that we decided to do, uh, this was several years ago, uh, was to collect a very large amount of data just from the patients. And the, the other thing to, to consider at that time was that we should probably do this with the very severe patients. Now, I, I've heard a lot of discussion here about severe patients, and some of these severe patients come to the clinic to give samples. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about severe patients that are bed-bound. They cannot even get out of the bed, let alone go to a clinic. Uh, and you have to go to them. So uh, this was a collaboration with Andy Koklenek. We picked his patients. He had a number of very severe patients. And we uh, set up a, sort of a mobile phlebotomy situation where we went to their house and collected all the samples. Uh, this consisted of urine and blood and saliva and so forth. Uh, and then we have been processing and analyzing that data ever since. Um, and we've also now started to do families uh, as well and uh, collecting family members. And I'm not going to talk about that today. But it, what the idea was to really collect a, a very large amount of information. Um, and uh, we're continuing to do that. The other idea was the fact that once we have the data and we're pretty sure that it's correct to post that data on a website, which we're doing, and, uh, and, and that's uh, in charge of that is Wenzang Zhao, who's been putting uh, that data up. Uh, it was complicated to do that uh, because we wanted it to be put up at Stanford, but uh, we had to poke a hole uh, uh, in, in their firewall. And so it took a long time to figure out how to do that without endangering Stanford. Uh, but these are just some examples of all the different things. Most of the immunology was going to be a collaboration with uh, Mark Davis, and you've heard him talk yesterday. Um, and then we uh, also used a lot of our own technologies. We're also developing new technologies all the time, and, and we're applying that to this disease. Uh, just to show you the severe patients, um, uh, this is just a, um, an SF36 score with a number of different diseases, and I just wanted to show uh, the, that, uh, in fact, um, uh, that, in fact, this is the, the patients here, and they're much worse off uh, than a lot of other diseases, including congestive heart failure. So these are very severe patients, um, and we call that the severely ill patient study. Uh, this is an example of, of, of the severe patient. Uh, this particular severe patient, uh, which happens to be my son, 
uh, is very fortunate, as you can see from this picture, he's really not that light sensitive, even though he's, he's covering up his eyes so he doesn't see me. Looking at me causes him great pain, and so he has to cover up his eyes, but he is not light sensitive, so he, we could go into his room after he covers his eyes um, uh, to, to work with him. Uh, but it always annoys me when people say, well, it's not such a bad disease. Uh, it's a very, very, very bad disease. And, and it scores very uh, highly when you try to look at the, uh, the, 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 dif the difficulty. Um, I'm just going to show you a few things about this uh, for the properties. Um, this is cytokines because they're often uh, discussed. Uh, and I think Jose Montoya talked about this as well. Uh, and the, uh, the severe patients, and I think I should call these very severe patients. Um, Uh, because they're, they're not really the same as a lot of other people's severe patients. Um, and they uh, have, um, uh, have a large, high level of, of cytokines, and we just put this on it. This is a 63 plex. Um, and uh, virtually all the patients uh, have a very high level of cytokines. Uh, we've done a, a search for infectious agents. Uh, by massive DNA sequencing. Um, the first one was really looking at particles uh, from the blood um, and then sequencing the, any particle and that would give you viruses, bacteria, funguses, parasites. Um, we did find a few bacteria, but those appear to be coming from the gut. We also undertook to do a, a big DNA sequencing project from, this, uh, from the uh, cell-free DNA. Uh, Ian Lipkin does this kind of stuff. And, uh, we were just doing this on the uh, severe patients, the very severe patients. Um, and basically, uh, we didn't find anything that was not found at the same frequency in healthy controls. Uh, we do find the SS uh, 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 viruses, but um, th that's not consequential. Uh, we have done a, a big effort to look for parasites because they're generally not looked for, uh, and we don't find parasites either. Uh, we have in development of fungus and uh, RNA virus uh, technology to look for those as well. Uh, also doing genomics, um, we, did, we carried out a, uh, uh, a complete genome sequence. This was done by Illumina for free. Uh, to, to give us support for our project. Uh, they went to 120 to 130 full coverage of the genome, uh, which gives us a very, very high quality sequence, plus it's an experienced facility. Uh, one of the things we discovered, and, and we're still going through all that data, it's an awful lot of data, um, we discovered that all 20 of the patients had a damaging mutation in a gene called IDO2. I'm going to cover that a little bit. Um, but it wasn't really considered very significant, and that's because uh, mutations in IDO2 are common. And so, in fact, if you do an automated search, it doesn't even come up. It's excluded because it has lots of mutations and therefore cannot possibly be important for any disease. And uh, <clears throat> however, it bothered us that every patient had that. Uh, the, the average frequency of uh, mutations was on 0.7. In other words, there's an awful lot of patients that were homozygous for mutations in this gene. So we undertook to, to do a uh, targeted sequencing. Uh, this was Bidong Chen who developed this as a, a technology. It's a multiplex PCR. Uh, a number of people have developed similar things to this. Uh, our effort here was to develop one that was very inexpensive. And, and would work on a very small amount of DNA. So this was designed to do uh, 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 newborn screening, where you have blood spots, and you can do a punch out of the blood spot, gives you about a nanogram of DNA, and we could amplify up any region or regions from that uh, to do an analysis, genetic analysis from the blood spot. Uh, we have gotten up to 1,000 different aplicons in a single reaction. Uh, we've also done that on the cystic fibrosis locus to do the entire gene. Uh, that's currently used in uh, testing uh, for CF at Stanford. 
So th uh, this is just to uh, give you an idea of how this works. And uh, um, the idea is to, uh, the problem with most of the PCR when you try to multiplex is you get an awful lot of homodimers. Uh, so you've got to do something to decrease that. Uh, and what is done is uh, to use targeted sequences. And as I said, we can go up to 1,000 different targets in a single reaction. Uh, but then you put on a primer. And it, this is what's called a homo tail, which means the sequence here is the same as the sequence over here. It's not a homopolymer. And, and because of that being the same, uh, when you amplify something, uh, they, there's homology between the two ends, and they will anneal to one another. But you do this fast, fast enough that they don't have a chance to anneal unless they're very close. So this takes out the homodimers that are created in the solution and allows you to do a better reaction. Um, and then you would do a second reaction and, and so forth to put it, to, 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 in order to put it into the sequencer. Um, and this has actually worked out quite well. Uh, and we've done this on a number of situations. Uh, so we've gone back and uh, looked at the IDO2. Uh, and the, and the, as I said before, the severe patients have 1.7 non-functional mutations in IDO2. We've done another 59 additional MECFS patients. All have a non-functional mutation in IDO2. Now, our, de our uh, definition for the patients is uh, a little more rigorous, I think, than most, uh, but we're very lucky that we're in the Bay Area because there's a, n a number of specialists uh, for this disease in the Bay Area. And so uh, they have to meet the, uh, all the definitions of uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, or MECFS, uh, but they also have had to have been seen by a specialist that's extremely familiar with the disease. And uh, we're very lucky that uh, Jose Montoya is there. Some of them are his patients. Uh, uh, Dan Peterson, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, there's, and several other uh, doctors that see a lot of patients. Um, and those, those doctors have to agree that they, are, uh, they have the disease. Now, one of the problems with the IDO2 is 75% of the population has a mutation in IDO2. That's caused genetics to say IDO2 is a very ancient gene, and it's on its way out. And it's absolutely irrelevant because there's another gene called IDO1, and that does the same thing. And here's the IDO1 uh, pathway. Uh, it's uh, what's also called the canurinine pathway. It's where you make tryptophan into ganurinine in one direction. And it, tryptophan can go um, by hydroxylating tryptophan to make serotonin. Reason we targeted this region is that we know um, that there's an immune effect on the patients and there's also neurological effects. This is one pathway that in fact would, would account for some of that uh, because it makes serotonin and canurinine, and canurinine is a regulator of the immune system. So we call this a, a model, uh, a, a metabolic trap, and I'll show you the details of that in a moment. Uh, this was uh, originated uh, by Robert Fair. Uh, Robert Fair is an undergraduate in electrical engineering at MIT and then got trained in uh, human physiology. Um, he was a professor at Johns Hopkins and resigned uh, because what he wanted to do was d doing systems approaches and he found it difficult to get that funded. And so he started a little company called Integrated Bioinformatics and uh, the pharmaceutical industry definitely needs this kind of technology. And so he's been totally busy uh, working in that. His neighbor had a uh, has chronic fatigue syndrome, MECFS, and um, uh, that's what caused him to come to us to donate one day a week for free. Uh, and so we set him up with a team. Uh, Julie Walmy is uh, the best technician I have ever seen. And uh, if you ever watch her work in the lab, you understand why. Um, and so we assigned her to work with, with Robert Fair. 
So this basically is a, a, a system fusion of, of a nonlinear system theory, which Robert Ferry is good at, uh, with genomics and biochemistry, uh, which I'm good at. And here's what you see um, with these enzymes. Now this is going back to 1967. And uh, I must admit that most uh, medical students and graduate students never read the literature from 1967. Uh, and, and that's one reason why this is a, a, a great, uh, uh, I think, a great theory, because it relies on some really old-fashioned great biochemistry. And so what you can see um, from this um, is that what happens as you, this is a standard plot of tryptophan versus the flux through the pathway is that the activity of IDO1 increases like it should for standard enzy enzymes, but then instead of plateauing, it drops. And that means it's substrate inhibited. Very unusual. And so this unusual property creates a real serious uh, problem, potentially, and that is um, that uh, if your tryptophan were to get too high, uh, then in fact, uh, you would inhibit the enzyme to the point where, in fact, you would not get any flux through the pathway. Now, biologically, uh, there is a backup, and that backup is IDO2. So if this were to ever really happen, uh, what you could do, is, what you would happen is that IDO2 would now be active. IDO2 does not bind tryptophan very effectively, but it is not substrate inhibited. And so, at the point where you get inhibition of IDO1, IDO2 kicks in, that would convert the tryptophan to canurinine, and then we drop the tryptophan concentration and you go back over the curve. So a p person with totally functional IDO2 and IDO1 would not have a problem. The problem is that if you have a mutation, even a single mutation in IDO2, so you're heterozygous, if you model that with system a systems biology approach, you realize there's not sufficient inactivity that you would actually still be trapped. So this model does not require a homo homozygous mutation. It only requires a heterozygous mutation. And that's unusual to have a phenotype generated by heterozygous mutation. And this other um, uh, second slide over here is uh, what happens uh, when you have uh, IDO2 defective you come down and, in fact, you are now trapped. So th this is certainly a possibility of happening. Is it what's causing cr chronic fatigue? Uh, MECFS is, is the next question, and, and uh, that's something that we're trying to figure out. So the key points really here is that in the, in the severe CFS patients, uh, they have a, it's very common to have the mutation. And, uh, and the idea, too, is the backup in, in other people. And this, re, and this generates something which we call a bistability. Now, that is actually one of the hallmarks of this disease. Once you get it, the chances of you getting over it are very slim. And so a bistability could explain that. In fact, what's interesting is that that's basically true for all chronic diseases. Once you get it, you don't get well. So th these kinds of models, in fact, might explain a number of chronic diseases, and therefore it's really important to begin to study them. Now there is a, a, a second trap that we find in the patients, and that's the tyrosine trap. And that has the exact same properties in the, in the severe patients. So it's possible that the patients are in both the tryptophan or the tyrosine trap, and we have to figure that out. So it makes a number of predictions. It predicts that the, that the cellular tryptophan will be increased compared to a healthy individual, that the, the uh, canurinine or the canurinine tryptophan ratio will be decreased, and that we can measure the catalytic rate of, uh, of the IDO2, and that should be decreased. Now, the way you measure that is mass spectrometry to measure tryptophan and canurinine. Uh, we have a mass labeled tryptophan that we can put in. We did the very first experiments. All six patients that we looked at first agreed with the prediction. Now, fortunately, we didn't run off and publish, which a lot of people might have done. 
uh, we did an error analysis. What is the accuracy of those measurements? And we also did rep took the samples and repeated it over and over again. We could not get consistent measurements. And error analysis suggested we are really on the, on the borderline of sensitivity of the mass spectrometer. We cannot trust that result. So we have to increase the signal. So we began to looking at why the signal was so low. We found several problems. In order to do the labeling, we have to put them into Eagles Media, developed in 1950. And Eagles Media has 25 milligrams per milli of tryptophan. They probably did not know the level in the plasma, which is 5 milligrams per mil. So that really dilutes the label. Um, Uh, the other problem was really uh, the sensitivity of the mass spectrometer. Uh, we have uh, a $600,000 mass spectrometer. It wasn't sensitive enough, really. Uh, you can do better. Uh, and Mike Snyder gave us, loaned his our use of his mass spectrometer, which is in excess of a million dollars, which is much more sensitive. And that will help a lot in the sensitivity of the assay. And then as we make those alterations uh, in our sampling, uh, we still don't get reproducible results. And I thought I would be able to come here today uh, because the first patient we put through confirmed the idea, but the second one did not. And so we still have some variability, and we have to figure out the variability. Uh, one of the variability is that it's probably only present in the dendritic cells, according to, li to the literature. Dendritic cells are only about 1% of the population, of the white cell population. So we've tried to uh, enrich by getting rid of T, and T cells and B cells. Uh, that helps the signal, but we still get lack of re reproducibility. I suspect one of the problems is that dendritic cells are quite variable in number. Uh, and then we yet have another problem that this trap is not a, a trap for the entire body, it's a trap for a cell. And therefore, it's probably cell autonomous. And so when a person were, were to get trapped, they don't necessarily trap all of their dendritic cells, they may only trap a certain fraction. And that fraction may vary with time, depending on the proliferation of those cells. So um, we, we're going to have to isolate dendritic cells, and we're going to have to look at them very carefully. Now, the other thing about this pathway, which is encouraging, is the fact that uh, this pathway is also on in, in the brainstem. And it's also active in the gut. So if this trap is true, you would expect to have effects on the immune system, the brain, and the gut, which you do. So it could explain a lot of things. What would happen in the brain is that the tryptophan would be high and it would make a great deal of, of uh, serotonin. That should cause a number of brain problems. It could also cause uh, the, 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 the lowering of the canarinine will, in fact, not cause lack of suppression of, of inflammation, which you also see. And in the gut, it turns out that the enzyme that makes serotonin in the gut is also substrate inhibited. And therefore, what would happen in that situation, as you make a lot of serotonin, you would then shut down that pathway and make virtually no serotonin. So it, it, it fits the observations, but we have to be, is it correct? And that's what we're working the hardest to try to figure out. Um, the next experiments will be using isolated uh, dendritic cells. We've done one patient, and that one patient shows consistent results with the metabolic trap from, from a purified dendritic cell population. Now we have to do many more. So, uh, and I think even if we get confirmation that dendritic cells consistently show this, I think we have to do more to validate this. And so I think that means we've got to try to set this up into culture and see if we can mimic and, and, and trap cells and see if we can get them out. And uh, the, the, that's, uh, that's uh, the next thing to, to be done. I wanted to show you just a few other things uh, in addition to that. And one of these is uh, uh, Mark Davis talked about his uh, 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 T cell activation. Uh, this is an experiment that Mike Sikora has done. 
showing CFS patients with healthy controls, and uh, they don't look very different. Uh, the, the one patient that we have um, that showed a lot of activation turns out to be later found out she was not diagnosed with cancer, and that's probably explaining that. And that's a general problem with this method that the patients may have something in addition. But also, uh, you can see uh, that there are, here's one patient that has almost no uh, detectable activation. Um, so there's not a significant difference. Now, as Mark says, well, that all in good, except that we don't know what the patients are reacting to. And they may be reacting to something different than the healthy controls, and he's right. And so that's why he's looking at what they are recognizing. And uh, this is a collaboration together. And uh, uh, I don't know how many more cells we will do for this, but I think it's important to, uh, to look at the, uh, uh, what, they're, what the activated cells are recognizing. Uh, the other thing we have to do is, in, in these patients that we're now looking at, we have to sequence HLA. Uh, we've been involved in that for a long time. Uh, we've, we, hit, we developed the method for high throughput uh, HLA sequencing. And so while we're at that, we will also uh, uh, do the Kerr locus, which is involved in virus susceptibility. And that's also a very complex locus. The other thing I just want to show you is a diagnostic test that we've been working on called a nanoneedle. Uh, this is an old slide, but it just illustrates this a little bit. Uh, that, uh, 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 this is a device which has uh, nanofabricated electrodes, uses a drop of blood, it measures electrical impedance. And uh, it's a very sensitive instrument. Uh, uh, we have 2,500 electrodes per centimeter, uh, and we sample each electrode 200 times a second. So it gives you a massive amount of data. And what you see uh, when you do this uh, you, you uh, uh, put blood minus the red cells, you then add salt right here, and when the salt is added, you get a perturbation in the electrical impedance, and then healthy patients basically are fairly flat. There's one patient here that goes up a little, uh, but no, that it doesn't really penetrate this area, and all of the MECFS patients show a strong signal. Uh, and this is kind of unusual for a diagnostic test to have it to be 100%. We've now done 10 more patients in controls. They also show the same thing. So even with this sample, the probability that you would find this uh, randomly is, uh, is one in a billion. So uh, this work has been submitted to PS, and yesterday they called me, and it's been accepted for publication. And uh, so it should be out in a, in, a, in a very short time. The other thing that we've done with this is to look to where the signal might be coming from. And we've done what's called the plasma swap experiment. And what it appears is that there is uh, information in the plasma um, uh, that you, you can uh, paste, take plasma from the, uh, uh, the patient's and, uh, and, and mix it with healthy cells, and you will get recreate the signal. But if you do the reverse with healthy plasma into MECFS cells, we don't see a signal. Um, you can then try to figure out what it is. We've done filtrations. It's easily filtered out. That means it's not a metabolite. The, the filtrations are such that it's not a cytokine. Um, and uh, we made a stab and said, oh, wait, it's an exosome. We purified exosomes from patients and added to healthy cells, and it recreates the signal. Now, that doesn't prove it's an exosome because it could be a contaminant of the exosome prep, but it, it's very strongly suggests an exosome. And, and that's kind of consistent with the microRNAs that have been looked at as well. So there's further work that could be done there. Uh, the other thing that we can do is to use this uh, as a, a test for drugs, you can put a drug in and see if it abolishes the signal. We do not know where the signal is coming from. My guess is it's coming from the damaged mitochondria, but I, that's only a guess. Uh, we have found two compounds that obliterate the signal. Uh, Copaxone is one of them, uh, and that is a collaboration uh, with Bob Navio, who's the first person to, to suggest that to us, uh, and also uh, in talking with him, we both concluded that the SS peptides should be tried. We have tried them, and they do that too. And that's a mitochondrial repair uh, drug. 
Uh, last thing I wanted to show you uh, is an observation by Laurel Crosby, who's here at the meeting, uh, that in uh, doing hair analysis, and we're doing that because it's actually very easy to do, uh, because you can have someone send you a gram of hair from anywhere in the world, and then you can analyze it by mass spectrometry. And uh, the interesting thing is the fact that uh, patients have uh, elevated, about a third to a quarter of the patients have uh, elevated mercury. Uh, and also, a little surprising is that we see elevated uranium, and especially in this one patient from Finland. Most of the, I think most of these other patients are coming from California. Um, so we don't know exactly the consequence of the uranium. Uh, but one thing uh, is that uh, it's not necessarily just the mercury that's the problem because uh, there, it's also, if you look at selenium, there's a correlation of high mercury, low selenium. And so the, the, the problem here may be more the selenium than it is the mercury. And so, in fact, it can be quite, the, the uh, selenium can be quite low. But also it's possible that even the high levels of uranium can cause selenium to get low. So any, maybe any of the heavy metals can reduce selenium. Selenium is used for T4, T3 conversion, and uh, T3 is often low in the patients. Uh, I've talked to a few patients like that. I've asked did they, did they check their selenium levels, and they said the doctor never even considered that. And so um, that's a possibility uh, that there are some, some of these metals are a serious problem. And that, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.